To my left, Laura Kotlowski, amazing artist, met her in the world of 2D, did some work together all the way from 2D all the way to 3D and VR all within a year. So she's been doing an amazing thing. She's an art director as well as a communication artist, right? Communication artist. And so I'll let her take it from here so she can share her story and her path from 2D to 3D to VR. Hello. Alrighty, my name is Laura Kutlowski, um, and as Matthias said, I'm a freelance creative director in Denver, Colorado. Um, I'm also um, a communications artist, and I say that because my background is varied. Uh, I was a formally trained artist, photographer, and graphic designer. And in the past year, I've actually added motion, or not past year, I guess the course of my career, past 13 years, I've added motion design, video editing, surface design, and filmmaking. And so what Matthias was alert, alluding to earlier and why my talk is called 2D to 3D to VR in less than a year is I actually started my journey, my full, full on course journey in Cinema 4D a little over a, half, a year and a half ago when I met Matthias. And at the time, um, I was just really interested in trying to wrap my head around how the program worked and how I could integrate it into my workflow. Now, stepping back and telling you a little bit more about myself, um, I would consider myself a 360 creative. So in my life, um, I've done everything from like, you know, my background is in fine art and painting, but I also love the outdoors and I grew up figure skating my whole life. So I'm very used to choreography and dance and movement and I used to do my own music editing back then. And more recently, I've really gotten into the roots of figure skating, which is actually designing figures on the ice and skating them. I also love to do paper cutting and every winter I hold these snowflake cutting workshops. And whenever I go out backpacking and hiking up to, to lakes and out on trips and adventures with my friends, I usually bring a sketchbook and a painting set and I paint on, on scene. It's called plain air painting. My studio is in Denver, Colorado, and it's in this really cool arts district. There's a lot of street art around, very vibrant community. My studio is actually in an old dry ice factory building, and I work on the old factory floor, giant windows. You can kind of see what I, where I work over here on the far left. And it's just a really inspiring space. Um, so this is a bit of my work. Um, I have, the majority of my roots are working for outdoor action sport, environmental, and uh, the food and beverage industry. Um, but I've designed everything from snowboards to beer labels to packaging, um, you know, fi fine art photography, as well as e-commerce photography, um, event design, yoga mats, um, you name it, I've probably designed something along those lines. So it's one of my goals in life to just kind of learn every creative tool that I possibly can. And my heart is really in creativity. If someone were to come up to me and be like, hey, let's do this project, I would be able to say like, we can do it this way, we can do it this way, we can do it hand done medium, we can do it digital medium. Um, and then I, I've built kind of a team of freelancers that I, I collaborate with on a, a pretty frequent basis. Um, I tend to work with um, agencies as high level help, but I also am like a one woman agency because I have that diverse skill set. So I'm not a stranger to unconventional methods, as I was kind of just explaining. Um, my eye kind of goes straight back to my fine art roots when creating graphics. And so for this piece, for SmartWool, um, as, as a testimony to that uh, unconventional method, I actually hand spun this wool and sewed it down to a piece of paper to create this graphic. Looking at this now and knowing Cinema 4D now, I know that I could probably create this in Cinema 4D Maybe it might be a little bit difficult for my skill set level at the moment because I'm still new in the program, but um, you can kind of see where my headspace is. I also, um, for this poster here, this is super unconventional as well, I actually designed the majority of these layers in After Effects using Trap Code Particular, and I designed the music notes, and I created the light streams in Trap Code Particular. The canvas was 18 by 24 inches in After Effects, and so I was exporting all these layers and recomposited it into Photoshop. When I first met Matthias, um, he was on his road show, and he came to Denver, Colorado. And in Denver, Colorado, E.J. Hasenfratz, who is a, a prolific um, 3D teacher, 
started the meetup there. He had just moved there, and we connected, and so I started going to the Cinema 4D meetups just to get connected to the community. The community in the Cinema 4D community is like amazing. Everyone's so helpful, so gracious and kind with their time. And uh, so EJ had Matthias come out, and I went up and talked with Matthias afterward and showed him my portfolio, my 2D design portfolio. And this was one of the logos that I kind of said to him, like, hey, can we create this in 3D? Like, I would love to see this, like, animated, like the buildings popping up and spinning around and things like that. And he's like, well, hey, we can do that. So we, can, we kept in touch over the past year, and he reached out to me just, like, a couple months later, and he's like, I want to take you from zero knowledge, basically, in Cinema 4D to commercially viable in 12 weeks through an incubator program that he's starting up called Learn 3D Fast. So if you want to learn more about Learn 3D Fast, go to learn3dfast.com. Um, and it'll, I think the email will shoot straight to him, and he'll get you hooked up. Um, so yeah, so that's how I met Matthias. Um, and so this kind of started me on my journey to 3D. Um, one of the first projects, like, and, and the reason why um, I really wanted to get more involved in the Cinema 4D is um, back when I was in the agency world, K2 Skis actually came to the agency that I was working for, and they actually brought us a CAD model, which is what you see here on the left, and then they gave us the graphics, and they gave us a photo of what the skis looked like, but they wanted me to take their graphics and skin it on this flat, like, 2D, I mean, it rotates, but it's a flat CAD model, and I wanted to go kind of above and beyond with this model. And so I actually took inspiration from the ski graphics itself, looked at the photos, saw how the ski was composited, and brought it into uh, Cinema 4D. So when I was looking at the graphics, I knew that there was going to be an X extrusion, I knew that there was going to be like the camber of the ski, which is the curve of the ski, and I knew that I needed to raise the binding up out of the ski. And coming from my fine art background and sculpture, I have a little bit of uh, experience in sculpture, I, I knew that those were the things that I wanted to do. So having that knowledge and coming into so Cinema 4D, I knew the shape and the model that I wanted to create. And so what I ended up doing is I built the model, and at the time, this was, this was back when I was in the agency world, it's about six years ago, um, I skinned this in Keyshot. I know that like, Octane has an amazing labeling system right now that works with Cinema 4D now, so I'm so, so excited to get my hands on that. Um, but yeah, it, it's so much more dynamic. It's true to the ski. It rotates. It's got the camber profile, which is that hump in the ski that creates the bounce when skiers jump off of jumps. Um, and they were super happy with it. They were like, wow, we were just expecting you to skin this, cat, this terrible CAD model that they had sent us. So moving on to the, the Learn 3D Fast class, um, learn the ins and outs of the program, and then had kind of like a master project, we'll you, will have you. And so I wanted to provide something to a local organization, Women Who Start Up, which is an organization that I'm a part of. And their roots are kind of in the tech industry, but they've gone on to entrepreneurs and supporting women entrepreneurs around the globe now. Um, so I wanted to create a 3D model based on their um, graphics and create something for their social media that can really like tell people like hey come to our base camp like and have it be interactive and have it kind of scroll through their social media and pop up in a fun way so the way I went about that is I knew that I wanted this sh the shapes were pretty simple I knew I could do those I knew that I could do the tent and the only thing like I, I wanted the the animation to actually mimic the shapes of the object coming from the design world so this is the little animation that I created So it's got like got a little bit of that um, that that perspective illustration style quality to it, and I mean the Seagraph branding kind of alludes to like the similar stylization to this. But in in Cinema 4D, you can create entire mini worlds like this, and and you know it just takes a second to like skew it to have that that perspective illustration style. But the, the cool thing that I really liked about this project um, was coming from my, my design skill set, I wanted the animation to also mimic the shapes and the playful personalities of um, the elements in the composition. So um, I knew that like, I wanted the trees to have like a jiggle and like a wiggle like when it popped up and flared out and, like a tent. And I wanted the mountains to bump up and, and populate out and I wanted the... the, cl the 
um, flagpole to come out and the flags to drop and unravel and unfurl um, in a really playful way. And I, I kind of had an idea of how to do the trees and the mountains and like the Denver base camp and the ex basic extrude, extruded and stuff. But what really kind of tripped me up when I was first figuring out this animation was the, the flag animation. Like, how was I going to get these poles to come out and like the flags to link to the spline? And um, I just couldn't wrap my head around it. Well, since then I have, as you can see. And so that's actually something that I really want to demonstrate right now because for the 2D designers out there that are already doing like the uh, skewed design style and want to try to create something in 3D, um, Matthias said it'd be a good good idea to show this project because you know people are going to be doing flag animations and things like that. So why don't you, why don't you show that? So that's where um, let's pop into Cinema 4D now, and I'm going to take a drink of water. So how I created those poles was, um, I'm going to start with a plane and expand this out. Um, I t basically took two cylinders, so taking up here two basic shapes, primitive shapes. Um, if you use these little yellow dragging tools, and I uh, apologize for more of the vets here because I'm going to go simple for the designers that want to get into 3D. Um, so just kind of using these yellow points, you can extrude up and move this little point around. Um, once I get into this, the creation of like the, the two different flagpoles, I like to pull it into um, the quad mode is what I call it. Um, still learning the names of things. So I'm going to pull the uh, flagpole up. And this, as far as like the size of this pole, like this to me feels good. So I'm going to uh, copy this cylinder out by just holding control, and then I'm going to make my little anchor point. So for the clothesline, you actually need to, it's called a spline, and we're going to draw a vector path in a second here, but you need to anchor it to something. So I'm going to rotate the little anchor point, and then I'm going to uh, just put it in place up here. Let me zoom in. OK, that looks good to me. And I'm going to make sure in the top view mode this is looking good. It's looking aligned up with my pole here. I'm actually going to make it a little bit smaller here. Scale it down just a little bit. That feels good to me. OK. And then I know that um, in order to attach an anchor point to something, you actually have to um, create this as an editable object. So in Photoshop terms, it's rasterizing like a vector object. So I'm going to rasterize this. And then I'm going to take my access mode. And I'm actually going to bring this anchor point to the front here. Because when you're linking something, it tends to snap straight to the access point. So I know that I want my string to attach here. And I don't want it to s attach into the middle of the pole here. And for those who want to see the perspective end of things. This is where I'm attaching it. Um, and then I can group these. So if you hit Alt-G to group these, which groups it into a null, it's, that's the, the C4D term. I'm going to name this poll. And then um, what we can do once it's in group mode is we can actually copy this whole group. Um, so just making sure I'm out of access mode. I'm going to drag this across. And then I can rotate this right here. And let's go 180. And I'm going to center these poles within my scene a little bit. That way, it's a little bit easier for me to animate later. Um, so then I'm going to drag my, so what I'm going to do is label my poles, too, because labeling is super important, especially when you're attaching anchor points to things. Right, left. And then I'm going to name my right anchor. I think I'm in caps mode. And then I'm going to do right pull. And then left anchor. And left pull. OK. So I've got my two poles here. I'm actually going to space these out because I want to leave room to bring my flag in between the two of these in just a minute. And I'm going to go back down to. Um, my front mode, and let me bring, I want to bring these anchors up just a little bit on the pole and zoom out just to make sure my scale is right. Okay, that looks about right. 
Um, so I'm going to pull in here. I still want my right pull to be a little bit further away and my left pull to be a little bit further away. And I'm actually going to start my flag now. I'm going to drop in my cube. So I make my flag out of the cube. And I'm going to squeeze this in. Let me s zoom out here. Using my little um, yellow points here, you can smush it in and then smush in the sides as well. And then you can bring it up to the top. Um, I'm going to go out to my side mode and pull it up to the top. It's still pretty huge, as you can see. And you can take these little blue triangles um, and scale it more uniformly by doing that. And let's zoom in a little bit more. And I'm going to shrink this a little bit, push it in, and then move it up to the top. OK. So I've got my flag in place. Let's see here. That's about right. We're going to come back to that cube. So I'm actually going to turn it off for now. And we'll come back to that. Um, I'm actually going to draw on my spline now. So I want my spline uh, or my rope, which will eventually be my rope. Um, you're going to take the what I call in Illustrator terms the pen tool um, or the spline tool. And we're going to link these two pieces together. Um, and whenever, um, and you hit escape to try to get out of point mode, but whenever you're doing um, splines and you want things to kind of bend, or actually any shape to bend or uh, deform, you need to add subdivisions. So we're going to add some subdivisions here so that it adds points along this line that can then droop when we add spline dynamics in a little bit, which is basically gravity. So I'm going to collect or select my two points here. The shortcut for subdivision is if, he, if you hit U, you can pretty much execute any command right after U. Just kind of like look down the side here, and S is our subdivide. We'll add, let's see, let's add 15 instead. There we go. OK, so um, I'm going to then take, I'm going to zoom in here, because um, sometimes splines act a little funky. And I'm going to make sure that I'm selecting the right point. So we want to take this left point and attach it to our left anchor here. So I'm going to go up to Tags, and we're going to go to the Hair tag, and we're going to take a, get a Constraint tag. Because what we want is this line to be taut as the pulls expand out and stretch out. So I'm going to get my uh, Constraint tag, and then we need to apply that Constraint tag to our left anchor. So we're going to pull our left anchor into our little Objects panel down here. And then you're going to hit Set. We're going to do the same thing to the right side. So hit the right. We're going to go up to tags, add a constraint tag. And then we're going to assign this to our right pole, or sorry, right anchor. And we don't want to get off of our spline mode. Um, so we're going to go to our right anchor. need to make sure that our constraint is clicked. Right anchor, set. And now we can add our spline dynamics and see what happens here when we add that. You can see a little stretchiness there. Oh, and there's a little droop. So you can see, and the, the, what I like to look for when I'm attaching things is there's a little yellow highlight that happens when you attach and anchor something to an object. So here's our spline here. Um, and the cool thing about this is we can actually, I think the next thing I want to do is um, group everything together. And we're going to actually animate this up. And then we're going to add our flag. So, um, so option G to group this. And we'll call this poles. And then so when we're animating, um, I'm going to go into this front mode again. And if you want to hit 0, it shows your scene, or H to show your full scene. And I know that at, um, so we're going to animate this in. So at 50 frames in, we want a key point. So the flags are going to come up and then expand out. So we're going to hit a keyframe at 50. And then we're going to go over down to 0. And I'm going to move it down. We're going to get out of point mode down below the surface here and hit another keyframe. And let's see if that works. There it goes. OK, cool. So now we're ready to actually like expand the poles out. So we're going to end animate the poles individually. So our right pole is grouped. So we're going to animate the right pole out. 
And I think, um, so we've got everything coming up at 50, so at 65, I want it to come out. So we're going to hit a keyframe at 50, and a left keyframe also at 50. And then we're going to drag our, uh, our time tracker thing here over to the right. And then we're going to um, move the left pole out to the side and hit keyframe. And we're going to move our right pole out to the side. And I think I just did something a little weird there with the wrong click. And then we're going to hit keyframe here. Let's take it out a little bit more. And let's see what happens here. Co comes up, stretches out. Yes. OK, so now let's actually add our flag back into the scene. Let's see here. Actually, what we're going to do next is um, add some depth to the spline. Because right now, it's just a line. So you're not going to see it in render mode here. Um, so we're going to add a circle into the mix. This is what's cool about um, so fast to actually like add volume to this. We're going to move this up to our line here. I'm going to zoom into this circle. We're going to scale this down super small. And we can adjust this in a little bit as well, um, make it super small. And then we're going to add a sweep. So we're going to actually add some depth to this. We're going to generate um, some, some volume. Uh, we're not going to do that one. We're going to actually come in here to, where is my sweep? There we go. So then we're going to take, um, we're actually going to pull this into here. And I'm going to take my spline and my circle underneath my sweep. And I'm actually going to zoom into this, because I thought this was really pretty cool the first time I saw it. So when you take something and put it under the sweep, it adds the volume. I'm going to actually squeeze this down. Let's see. You can change the volume here. That, that's looking a little OK. I might want it a little bit skinnier to match my, my anchor point, because I want it to be a little bit thinner than the anchor point. Whoop, there it goes. OK, cool. So now we've got depth to our, um, our spline. I'm going to zoom out. So we can see what we're doing here. And let's bring, turn back on our cube. So here's our cube. And we want to attach it to this um, flag, or sorry, this spline. But also, we want it to bend and curl up. So actually, let me show you that little um, animation one more time. So it comes out, and the flags unravel out. So we're going to add um, a bend deformer to this. And I think what I might do just real quick is squish this in a little bit further and scale it down. Um, we also need to subdivide this because it's actually going to wrap around and curve. Um, so our, we're going to make our object editable or rasterize it. Then we're going to add our subdivisions again. So US. And maybe let's add, let's see what 15. Oh, that might be too many. Um, this is different in our 21, so I'm getting used to that right now. Oh, that's still kind of a lot. Let's see. Let's do, let's try four. That looks good to me. Um, okay, and then we're going to change our access point because we want our access point to attach to the spline here, and it's going to bend up around that access point. So we've got our access point there. We're going to turn the access mode off. And then um, let's see what, let's add our bend deformer. So our bend deformer is what's actually going to make this cube bend. We'll pull it into our little mixture here. Um, I believe, let's see. Oh, we're not going to do that. Here, let's bring it out of our null here. And we'll work on it here. And let's pull, we'll go up. Yeah, OK. Ben Deformer goes underneath the cube. That is David Ariev over there. He's like my on-call help you, David. in case Appreciate I need help. help. 
since we're still new here. OK, so I'm going to move this up. So let's bring our Ben Deformer up to the top. Whoop. I'm going to actually unknull un un this for right now, and we'll bring it up. And scale it down over here. And now, um, let's see which way this is bending currently. So it's going the wrong way. We want it to bend out. So let's rotate it. Let's see. Let's do 90 here. Let's check how, how it's bending now. It's bending the wrong way again. So we're going to have to rotate it again. Another 180 the other direction. And there, well, starting to bend a little bit. Let's try this. There we go. So it's going to actually bend and wrap into itself here. So we're going to set this to zero, uh, put the bend underneath the cube, and then we are actually going to fit this to the cube. And let's see if this works right. Oh, look at that. How cool is that? So it's bending and spinning into itself there. Um, that looks good to me. Um, and so we can actually, um, let's see, we can animate that bend here. So we'll start, so if we've got our scene, the pulls come up and then they start to come out. I actually want my, my flags to unravel at like 65. So I'll set my first bend keyframe um, a little bit later. So 75 is, so this is my final result. I'll go back and I'll increase the bend to 360 and hit my bend here. Let's see if that works. That didn't work. Let's see. So it's curled up now. When we get to 75, let's hit this to zero. Let's hit that keyframe again. And there it goes. Cool. All right, so we've got our bending fly, we've got our flag poles, both are animating right now. Now, how do we get that whole strip of flags? We're actually gonna go up to MoGraph and we're gonna add the clone tool. So we're gonna add, put our cube underneath the clone tool and this is kind of a new trick that I just learned um, literally this morning, um, is you don't want to fix your clone. Um, actually, so we're going to go to object first, because we want to attach our clone to our spline. Um, so we're going to bring our spline into this object mode. And here we have a bunch of flags on the, on the pole here. Let me pull it out to big mode. Um, so when you click, whoop, a line clone, there we go. That's going to fix it to, so right now it's aligning it to um, the pole, and we want it to be separated out. We're, and then we're going to increase, I'm going to actually uh, get this out even. And then the cool thing about this is let's increase our count of flags so we can add flags on here. And I'm going to go back to quad mode, my front mode down here. And I'm going to shift this whole flag situation over, maybe. Oh, there we go. Access mode does it. OK, thanks, David. OK, so let's see what's happening now. There we go. Awesome. And what we can animate is like, see how the flags are overlapping right now? We can also animate the how the clone or the how the count is coming out. So if you go back to when the poles rise up, we can knock our count down to one. Or um, the other thing that we can do is if you go into basic, you can enable it, like basically turn it off or turn it on. Uh, but for here, we're going to go up and because we want the poles to bring up the flags as one unit and then string them out together. So when it expands, so we go to 65, we're going to boost our count to 12 and hit that. 
and let's play it back. So coming out as one, that keyframe might not be working right now. Oh, it's still set to 12. Let's see. Got one. We've got 12. One. Cool. Let's start this from the beginning. Out. Yeah. So there we go. So that's briefly how I created those flag systems. And um, you know, once you get a little bit more into Cinema 4D, you can add things like a wave function or a wind function, add a little turbulence to it, add the flags, get them to jiggle. You can also um, basically color these individually and randomize the coloring of the flags too. That gets a little bit more in depth. So even coloring, you don't have to individually color each flag. You can do that randomly. Um, so yeah, that's something just really cool that I learned for that project. I'm going to pop us back, yeah, back into my presentation here. So, so that was the first major project that I finished up. Within 12 weeks, I think we started this project towards the end of those 12 weeks. And then I started, like, I kind of wrapped my head around how I could use this in the future. And prior to getting some knowledge on Cinema 4D, my workflow has always been hand illustration first. So this is actually a chalk illustration, um, charcoal illustration of the maps, layered them up in a 2D way, and then placed them on like some you know flat layers in Photoshop. And that's how I was compositing. I was compositing in Photoshop, then going into After Effects and animating. But now, what I've been doing is I've actually been taking height maps, and I've been extruding the height maps in Cinema 4D, and I'll make my, cr my texture in Photoshop first. So sometimes I'll take the height map, sometimes I'll do a painting over a map landscape, and then I'll use that as a material in Cinema 4D. So I'll extrude it out of a block in Cinema 4D, and then I'll add my material, which is my, or my Photoshop painting, and then I'll bring it back into Photoshop, composite it, and animate it in After Effects. So that's something that I've fully integrated into my workflow now. Something that I'm playing around with um, even further, though, is then creating top views of extrusion, extrusions, then overlaying artwork or map illustrations over top of 3D flat surfaces. So right now I'm working on a Mac that only has a six core processor. So once I beef up my machine or everyone's telling me go PC um, just to like use Octane or something like that, I'm really like excited for Redshift. Um, but once I get a better rendering machine, I'm excited to do fly throughs and things like that. So which then leads me to my latest project. Um, so in the fall, I was given the opportunity to take a one day virtual reality workshop. Um, and in the process of that one day virtual reality workshop, they took us from basically, you know, zero knowledge to like then into po post production. And for me as a designer, I've had my eye on the virtual reality world for a long time now, um, around four or five years. And four or five years ago, the technology just wasn't there for me. The resolution wasn't there for me. And, um, but I really wanted to learn how to do graphics for that space um, because I know it's the way of the future. Everyone's focusing on it. Um, how do I get in when the going is like low, like there's low designers in that space right now, a low amount. So um, just kind of trying to set myself up for success in the future. So I uh, went to that workshop, and then because I went to that workshop, um, it was a partnership between Google and the Adventure Film Festival in Boulder. So given my adventure background, uh, that's how I knew about the virtual reality workshop. And um, after we attended that uh, workshop, I was able to apply for a Google grant um, that Adventure Film was putting on to, basically they gave it to five filmmakers um, to create mini virtual reality short films. Um, my pitch was to do a wild ice skating film about skating in up in Canada and around Colorado. So using my skating background and my hiking to high alpine lakes, um, they were super drawn to that. We ha they were like, we haven't seen anything like that before. And so that was my pitch. Um, Google shipped me out the camera equipment, took a two and a half week road trip up to Canada and shot all of the footage. Now, afterwards, 
got back down to Denver, started logging the footage, and quickly realized this post process was going to be gnarly. Um, I ended up, over the course of, this is only a five, and a five minute, 45 second film. I've got headsets over here if you guys want to watch it afterward. But I ended up using 14 different apps to create this film. Um, but as you can see, like right now, the background of this slide right here is um, what it's going to be looking like in Premiere. I'm going to take you through Premiere and I'm going to take you through the exporting process so that for the more advanced Cinema 4D users here, maybe it, 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 in, it challenges you or inspires you to start working in virtual reality as well. Because what I was finding when I was editing the footage and then I started adding my titles in there, it was weird to me to see flat graphics in a 3D space or a 3D environment. Um, it just felt natural to me to put 3D graphics in a 3D space. Um, and then uh, coming from my design side, I didn't want it to uh, obstruct the viewer's experience, though, either. So I wanted it to gel really well with what the subject matter of the film was. So um, just kind of thinking ahead, um, right now when you first go on to YouTube, and let's see if I can pull this up here. Um, I'm going to type in, so the film is called To Return, and then I usually just do wild ice skating. Um, and here it is right here. So when you first pull it up, um, what YouTube does is it actually takes virtual reality footage and it flattens it. So it stretches it out and flattens it. And then it centers it. So it looks very odd when you first might encounter it outside of a headset. But what you're trying to get people to do is actually like see for the best immersive experience, use a headset and headphones or a Google Cardboard. Um, and, but I wanted this to be engaging. I didn't want to be obstruct the actual user's experience once they start flowing into the film. So I was like, how can I transition this? Because I need the, f the text to look OK in 2D, but also in 3D. Like when you have the headset on, it needs to also look and seem uh, flawlessly. Um, so uh, I just kind of racked in my brain. I was like, I want to create a crystal scene. So like frost freezing on a crystal plane or a pane of window that then melts and dissolves, and then you enter the VR world. Um, so coming from my fine art background um, and design background, and, but I was still kind of new in Cinema 4D, I was like, how can I get, achieve this look and feel the quickest? Um, and when I was looking at um, what other people were doing as far as like Cinema 4D crystal rendering and the geometry that was involved um, and um, how things populated and kind of moved in and more like a geometry type way, I was like, I want my crystals to be more organic. So coming from a design background, I actually ended up, um, let's stretch this out, creating all of my crystals on my iPad to start. Because even Illustrator wasn't giving me the look and feel that I wanted. So I took uh, the Illustrator app on my iPad, actually hand illustrated all of the crystals here. Um, and then what's cool coming from design into Cinema 40 is you can basically um, you know, select everything and make it a, you know, expand all of the paths, make sure that there's no paths left. And then you can actually pull it into Cinema 4D. And I'm going to switch um, projects now. Um, so this is, might take a million years to render, so I'm not actually going to like make you sit here and watch this render. But I just did some basic stuff. So I brought in the flat. So when you bring in flattened Illustrator files into Cinema 4D, um, it's basically a spline. And then I extruded the spline. So I basically added an extrusion. And then I added some caps to it. So I added a fillet cap to the front. And then I knew that I wanted to it to sit across a window plane. So I wanted the back to be flat. And then the caps were going to be in the front. Um, and then I just like played around with materials. Like it was uh, kind of plug and play, like just cycling through. How can I get this to look like ice? How can I get this to look like glass? Um, I ended up using some reflection um, and some refraction. I used a Voronoi um, fracture noise on here. Um, and then it was lighting. So I used a physical sky. And then I used four or five different lights that were lightly tinted orange and blue because I wanted it to blend with my crystal scene as you enter the VR world. So I uh, exported this. Um, 
I ended up compositing a bunch in Photoshop first, but then after that I actually brought it into After Effects to animate the different crystal layers. So when I first play the... Um, let me go through and play that intro sequence. Um, let's see if we can do it full screen, though. So I, I ended up... Um, animating this in three different layers, the crunch in the beginning here. So I composited in Photoshop, brought it into After Effects, and animated those layers separately. Um, kicked it into Premiere. And then this is where things get funky with virtual reality. So over here, we have our virtual reality footage. And I brought in... Um, I knew that I wanted the crystal scene to be the closest back to the, the footage, and then I wanted the uh, text to kind of populate in the middle here, and then I wanted the headset to be up in front and pop out at you and expand, and I also wanted it to mimic the way that you should be looking when you're in the headset, so it's rotating around to kind of cue the viewer into like, hey, like look around. One thing I forgot to note is this is a Virtual Reality 180 film and not 360. Um, so you're only looking in peripheral vision for this film. Uh, what Google is finding is that a lot of people in virtual reality films, are when they're focused on something, they don't necessarily want to turn around and look behind them. So there's a big push for Virtual Reality 180 right now because of that. But what's funky is when you're adding your graphics into Premiere, say, for a film project like this, um, in order to get it to fit to the two different windows here, you're actually going to use an effect called plane, plane to Sphere. So if you go into Video Effects in Premiere and you go to Immersive Video here, um, you go down to Plane to Sphere, and that's what kicks it on. So if I show you um, how this is wrapped onto, if we go to our effects... And I show you, so right now it's on, Plane to Sphere is on. If you turn it off, it looks like this. It looks like a giant mess. So it imports as flat. So until you tell it, like, hey, this is a virtual reality film that I'm working on, and you add that Plane to Sphere facet, it's not going to recognize it. But when you're actually editing the different layers in Premiere, um, you have to... Uh, work with the disparity. So when I actually edited this, I added the virtual reality feature here um, into my little window and hit OK. And it actually brings up an anaglyph editor. So this is where red and green, green glasses are used to actually figure out what disparity you're going to use in your um, in your footage, so how to split up the different layers, how to get one layer in front of the other and then the other. Um, so then, yeah, you have to go into kind of a little bit of analog mixed with digital. Um, then when you're exporting, you just go up to File, Export, and you just have to make sure your virtual reality settings are turned on. So having your, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have your maximum depth, render depth here. You've got your maximum quality over here. But if you scroll all the way down for export, um, there's this VR video setting. And so sometimes, like since I've been using this for a while, it's already set to 180, but it might already be set to 360. The other thing is when you're editing video footage, you can either do it side by side or vertical, like top over bottom. Make sure that if you're editing side by side, you've got side by side checked. Um, and then you've got 180 here in your horizontal view and 180 in your vertical view. When you hit export, it generates a massive file. This is a 10 gig file for a five minute piece. Ended up rendering it at 6K. So VR 180 Creator is what actually injects, your meta or injects the VR virtual reality metadata back into your video once you've exported it. So if you've exported it and you uploaded it to YouTube, it's not going to read it as a virtual reality video until you re-inject that meta metadata that says that it's a virtual reality video. So you inject it, and with vir uh, VR 180 Creator, the app, um, it will actually add the, the, the tag onto your file that says injected, You'll upload it to YouTube. And when you upload it to YouTube, what'll happen is there will be like a little window that says, hey, 
I recognize you're uploading a VR video. If you want to know more information about uh, VR best practices, like head over to this Google channel. Google has a huge library of resources for virtual reality um, post-production. Um, and so you can head over there. And uh, let's see here. I'm wrapping this up. So the film is called To Return. You can come up and watch it here afterward. I've got a couple headsets over here. I've got multiple headsets. I've got the um, Lenovo Daydream. I've got the Oculus Go. And then I've got Google Cardboard, or if you want to watch it in your phone. This was my little intro scene. If you want to find out more about me, you can find me on all of the social medias. Uh, Laura Kutlowski on Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, and Behance, and then as well as Laura Kutlowski Design on Facebook and Instagram. My website's there. Um, I don't keep up with social media that often, but you can see my skating stuff as well as my um, virtual reality stuff. And some things that I'm like, most excited about to use in Cinema 4D moving forward are um, landscapes and creating landscapes and getting more into 3D maps and fly-throughs and all sorts of stuff like that. And so um, I've been watching David Ari Arya's uh, tutorials on that. I'm really excited to start integrating that into my workflow in the future. Thank you. Thanks for watching. <laughs>